Um, so one of the things we're going to one of the things we're going to focus on tonight is um, in this era of fake news, we're going to talk about trust and how we can build trust with our brands and with um, customers and consumers. The last session we talked about getting people's attention. So how can you get people's attention online in this world of noise and fake news and individual comment and in, you know. Let's think about Trump, let's think about Brexit, let's think about all these things going on in the world at the moment. And people tend to not trust what they hear online so much now. We did some testing for a different client of mine on uh, last Thursday. Um, um, uh, these were all people over 45. Um, it was from McCarthy Stone. I don't mind telling you. So it's McCarthy Stone, certain uh, demographic. Uh, we were looking at how they viewed Facebook and social media. 10 people, out of those 10 people, nine people said um, they didn't trust Facebook, but they were on it all the time because they were addicted to it. They didn't believe what they read on Facebook. So when they saw an advert on Facebook, <laughs> rather than clicking on the advert and going to the website, they looked at the webs looked at the advert, opened up another window in their browser and typed the website in because they didn't trust the link from Facebook to the website. Yeah, you do, right? I've done that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're your customers. Maybe it's McCarthy and Stan, maybe it's Amazon, they your, they're your customers. So um, that was just a micro example of these, these, these really difficult challenges we've got with people trusting what we put online. Whether you're a holiday park, whether you're a retailer, whether you're a council, whether you are me or a Dale's a digital agency, it's making sure people trust what you put online and how do we, do, we go about it. So. Because Alistair's not here and he's dead to me, we're going to turn that. <laughs> um, Lisa Tricky from Dorset County Council, you are. Tell, tell, well, I've written down what you are, but you're Lisa to me, so <laughs> what's, your, what's your job at the council? Um, so I'm really lucky because I have two jobs at the council. Um, I, one of my jobs is digital design manager, so leading on our implementation of our digital strategy, and the other is I work with social adult social care around their digital program with work effectively. So two hats. This is Tom, Tom Avery from Watercrest Company and one of two other things. So do you want to tell a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, work at Watercrest Company, been there 20 years. Um, we uh, supply salads and watercress all over the UK to about four and a half thousand stores, uh, all sorts of supermarkets, but we also do a lot of work with independents. We've got a company called the Wasabi Company, which was a startup ten years ago, which is building quite nicely, very different to the watercress side of the business. Uh, and then we've got a few other businesses, one of them is the Bracer Butchers just up the road, so many of you will know about that. So quite a range, but mainly to do with the food industry or associated sort of sector within that. And I don't know who this guy is in the end, he's just come <laughs> off the street. Um, but the reason I thought it would be good to have Dave on the panel is not because of his expertise, but because he's building this company. And um, for those of you who've been with us for a while, we've gone from four or five guys to yep. in a little office to this, 10, 11, 12 guys. Yep. Um, do you want to say a bit about you outside of the scope of Yeah, okay. Um, <coughs> I started Key, what was Key Multimedia uh, back in 2007. Um, we started up in a little office just around the corner here in Prospect House. Uh, gradually grew the business from a one man team, uh, added three or four in, um, and then we did a rebrand two years ago. Digital um, and gradually growing the business uh, from there to the point where we're now 11, nearly 12. In who's, the space the, who's the nearly 12? That'd be Jamie. Jamie's nearly 12. Um, okay, so all different sizes of companies and organisations, all with the same challenge. How do you build trust with customers? So, how have each of these three <coughs> built trust with their different audiences and their demographics? So, the first question really is I'm going to pick on Tom. So, how on earth do you build trust using digital tools in, in, in general from, to, from from where you started from to four and a half thousand stores? Because mm. yeah, that is... Well, yeah, we're lucky. We've had the four and a half thousand stores for a long time and therefore the digital platform for us is starting to replace what we would have done in the past in different ways. Mm. Um, the reality is our consumers are quite old uh, and what we're trying to do is communicate to a younger audience and that's where the digital platform comes in. We, the, the, 
the most important part of trust within our industry is word of mouth. So people pass on a message for us. So if you can get that message into individuals and they believe it, they will then pass it on. So social media isn't the end of the communication platform. It's actually the passing on of the message that's really important for us. So we've got uh, an aging population that's consuming watercress, generally people looking for like a well-being kind of experience, you know, using watercress to help last, make them last a little bit longer, you could say. Um, but what we're trying to do is come back from that and look at a sort of a more performance kind of conversation now. And that, that is about a different message, it's a very different approach. So traditionally we would talk about the health benefits associated to watercress, but now we're having to use the digital platform to create a sort of a lifestyle uh, occurrence and what watercress can do in terms of you know, physical performance in gyms and that type of thing. That's helping us uh, with the, the sort of the, the, um, the digital platform. So how did that, that's a good point, because I've never really thought of that. So, so what point in your business development did you go, there's a new audience here, and, and at what point did you think, did you identify the best channel in which to engage with them? Yeah, we started uh, our watercress campaign, say, 20 years ago. Uh, and back then, the, the campaign was very much based on paper and magazine, and it worked quite well. And we were then punctuating the sort of the periods with, say, research or big findings that we could do. And they worked really well, particularly in the food industry, because back in sort of the noughties, you know, there weren't many big research projects. Then we went through, say, from 2007 to 2012, sort of roller coasting on that success. And then post-2012, it's got more complicated. So then we were then sort of in that early stages of digital where we felt that we needed to bring an agency in. Mm -hmm. So we brought an agency in to help create content. But the problem was it wasn't trusted because the danger is the consumers see uh, quality very clearly. Um, it doesn't really matter about the age group, but if they are reading something they don't feel is quite correct, they won't trust it. So we uh, tried for several years with agencies, trying to communicate to the agency what the values were of us and what they meant, but it didn't really work. So what we ended up doing is bringing that in-house and creating our own internal team. Even though we're a small company, um, proportionately we would have focused lots of money on technical and, and commercial sort of staff. We've now focused more on the PR stroke, innovation stroke, creative staff and we put an awful lot of time into that. So we take messages from the farm that are genuine and then put those out into social media or through magazines and papers that works really well. And that, that sort of genuine story makes a big difference. You know, if you've got a grower for us, a member of staff that really comes across as very genuine, people will watch that, they believe it, and then once they've believed it, they will pass the message on. Because you're gonna basically give them something to take away. Yeah. And that, that little something they take away could be about the health benefits or a little interesting fact or did you know, and they'll take that and they'll pass that on and that's what will give us our, our sales growth or replacement into the younger audience. So it's authenticity. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And what about you, Dave? Because for those that don't know, there's, there's, there's um, I work <coughs> with, with different companies and there's four or five pockets of digital hotspots around the UK. One of them is in Bournemouth, one's in Bristol, uh, and there's a growing one in Exeter. So we're in this, <laughs> one could argue this Bermuda Triangle, <coughs> yeah. um, and we're starting to make a bit of a difference, and we're starting to make a bit of noise, and we're starting to worry people, which is really good, because <laughs> I hear it. Um, how have you done that? How have you built trust? I know there's customers here, so <laughs> how have you built trust amongst the customer base and the staff to help the company well, I'm probably going to steal a bit of Tom's message there, and actually... That's why he, he went first. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> ah, but focus on the authenticity. This is about being, A, true to yourself, but also being real. I don't think I could stand up and deliver a message that I didn't believe in, didn't honour, you know, couldn't hand on heart say, oh yeah, you need to do this because actually that pays the bills. It doesn't, you know, these things have got to work. And I think it is about being authentic. And you, know, you see so many times now the mistrust that we've got in terms of, you know, dare I say it, the government, the newspapers, the TV, you know, to some extent the TV. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think there's an opportunity now for organisations to take that lead and go, well, actually, we're the expert on this. 
field, whether it's digital, whether it's um, social responsibility, or whether it's you know, water crisis. Yeah. Um, and actually people believe us because we are the experts on that topic. Right. And being authentic about it, and delivering that message that people realise is a real message, because, well yeah, you're, you're actually living it, you're breathing it, you're doing it. Right, I'm going to ask a question that we did talk about before, okay. which, which I always do. We, we, we do our marketing in a very different way to other agencies, right? We're not shouty, we're not, no. look how fantastic we are, you know. So, so, I know the answer to this, but was that a, was that a strategic decision for us not to do that, Dave? And if it was, why did we come, why did you come to that decision? Yes, it was a strategic decision, Dave. <laughs> um, we, did, we decided that actually, um, we didn't want to fight with the Bournemouth crowd. Yeah. We don't want to get involved in, you know, pitching for work, but in, in the Paul and Bournemouth area, there's some very nice um, businesses in the Paul and Bournemouth area. Um, that we work yeah, with. yeah, 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 there's lovely ones, um, just not digital agencies. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but actually, it's quite cutthroat. So we decided, well, actually, we're going to stay under the radar. Um, I can't even remember what the saying was, um, that we'd... Uh, Walk off into the night or something? We'll still walk off into the night. We'll take their money and walk off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we started doing it, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, and we're still doing it. But yeah, we, we, we deli we've deliberately said we are going to grow this through word of mouth, through local, through trying to be experts and position ourselves that way. What about you? So, so <coughs> adult social care is a very emotive thing. And it's a very personal thing. And talking about government, not trusting government, <laughs> right? I'll, I'll, disclaimer, I used to work for the council a long time ago as well. That's where I met Lisa and Richard and my two others. Um, so I know the challenges we have to break down people's we have to, to break down people's perception. So how we'll put a video on in a minute, we'll play it silently in the background on that screen, which is the one you sent me and made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> But how did, how, did, how did you guys, especially with adult social care, how do you break down those perceptions and mistrust of, of councils? I suppose there's a couple, of a couple of subtle differences, I guess, from private business in that the council, we've probably got a hundred different businesses within the council and, and different brands, so everything from fixing the potholes in the road to countryside rangers to social care. Um, so it's, it's really um, diverse, and I guess quite often people don't get a choice whether or not they choose to, to use that service or not. So part of what we're trying to do in terms of digital is try and push people as much as we can to digital channels to relieve um, some of the pressures we have on services and the capacity to deal with those that are more vulnerable face to face. And a lot of that is through kind of being open and transparent and you know, good communication. And I suppose historically in the council it would probably be to say marketing wasn't a term we really no. used and we were in we're getting into now. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a bit of a different It's raising the profile, right? It is raising the profile and showing people the you know, like the possible, you yeah. know, the opportunities that are available, um, but also looking at how we can support communities to, to move forward and adopt um, yeah, new tech. Can I ask a question? So how many of you would be happy to hear that your council is spending money on marketing? It's only tight. Okay. No, 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 no,
So does that make you feel about that? You know, that costs money. That well, it's building to know why they pay the council tax and what that money can spend on. That. Yeah. So as long as they're not spending more on that than delivering the services, that should be fine. Does it affect the way you trust the council more or less? I, I find trust a very difficult word. Yeah. yeah. Because I don't know. I think one of the questions might be just to say, what does trust mean? Yeah. Please. You've read my thing, yeah. <laughs> because um, often I think people talk about trust when they're actually talking about desire. They try, it's often a company say we want our, our uh, customers to trust us, but well, actually they say they want, we want our customers to want to buy what we're selling. Yeah. And I feel like it's, uh, you need to understand what people are saying when they talk about trust. Yeah. Which is one of my questions for Tom. In that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, Tom's selling a product. So how do we build that? Yeah. I'd definitely say it is about trust. Desire, the desire comes through from what is it that the product contains for us. So you know, people are going to desire watercress because you know, I look at James because he's like, he's the man that helps <laughs> all this happen. But yeah, the, the desire is about what's in the product, what does it taste like, what ingredient can you use it in, all those kind of things. The trust element is actually, do I really think these guys are going to deliver on the things I need them to deliver on? So there's all sorts of things about that. Kind of, you know, we could be talking about, is it safe to eat? Yeah. Is it actually going to last as long as I think it's going to last, which isn't very long with Watercrest, but that is part of our story. Um, do these guys really work quite ethically? You know, do they look after their staff? You know, are they thinking about the environment? That's a big one for us because you know, we could be discharging into rivers and making a hell of a mess. So there are so many different things, but different demographics are going to see trust in totally different ways, and I get that. So we have to think, well, what are the 19 to 25 year olds going to see as trustworthy? And what are we going to see the 55 to 60s as trust, you know, relevant? So when we talk about our plan and what, what we're going to create and go out and do, you have to think about those sort of um, parameters within all of those age groups and de social demographics, because we are feeding everybody. You know, mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter who you are, we're looking to try and obviously provide that nutritious bag of, mm -hmm. of watercress. Well, traditionally, as you said, it could have been a scientific study years ago, so the scientific study says it does X, so that there's a certain demographic that would understand that and believe that, mm -hmm. but the younger they might look towards an influential you know, ambassador that if we can get them to actually agree and read the scientific studies, then they deliver that trust in a different way. So it's, they're also balanced, I think, between desire and trust. We well, have to I would say, say, for example, on my desire might be I want to lose weight. Mm. Okay, so then I'm trying to find something which is going to allow me to fulfill that need within me. Mm -hmm. And then I suppose the trust then comes is that if you make a claim that you're going to have me lose weight, then therefore I've got to trust you in order to, to but it all comes back down to what I want rather than yeah. what you're saying. That's the desire yeah. and the trust is, yeah, it's, it's going to be a different part of that mm. process. Yeah, yeah quite. If you're I, I, I need more to push you. The trouble is with me, yeah. you're going to be careful. careful. It's also battling awesome. 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 against. <laughs> You know, misinformation, aren't you? I mean, it's yeah. continual. But that was one of my next points, actually. I, I can just sit here and let you talk because yeah. I kind of start to. But it is that how, how do you. So, okay, Dave, right, let's pick on Dave for a minute. So, so, how do you pick the right type of tech, the right message, the right channel to, like Ross says, Ross works for the RNLI, by the way, so he's kind of. Not for very long. <laughs> <laughs> no, you haven't been there very long. No, no, right? no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, te I'll text your boss in a minute. So, um, um, so that you, you've got that organisation, irrespective of people trust that organisation, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's been built up over, I don't know, how long has it been there? 100 years? It's 200 years, but I've only been there three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't quote me on that. But how, how, how do you, Dave? When you're working with a client, some of the clients in the room, how do you identify the best channel, the best tech, the best message to send out for a holiday park, as opposed to the Warcraft guys, as opposed to council, as opposed to you know how would you what's your, how'd you go? 
So if you were sitting out in the audience and you yep. were running, what would you, what kind of steps think, would you go through? I think initially it's got to be understanding who your customer base is. And first and foremost, you know, do you know who they are? We, we bang on about personas and you'll hear us talk about it uh, for everyone in the day, trying to you know, get under the, the skin of a client and say, well, look, you know, what, what are the personas? Who, who are your different customer groups? Can you get a clear idea of who they are, what tech do they use, what social media do they use? Um, and then, you know, I'd then be asking them, in terms of their customer base, actually, which social channels, for instance, do you trust? You know, hand on heart, if we were to do a quick poll, you know, how many people trust Twitter? You know, fish. How many people trust Facebook? Probably down here. How many people trust LinkedIn? We'd probably get a better show of hands. So I think it's, it's, it's about choosing the right channel with your customer base. But sometimes but if, no one's, but if, no, sorry, if no one trusts social media, yeah. how do we address that? How, how do we, you know? I, I, I personally think it's, 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 it's then about how you use that channel. And it is about coming across as being authentic, being the expert, um, creating damn good content. Mm. It starts with a really good content strategy. I don't think it's as clear cut as I don't trust that platform. I don't trust it's elements within the yeah. platform, isn't it? Yeah, so your right. messages. <coughs> yeah. It's in the appropriate location. We were talking about it the other day, you know, you end up putting some paid for adverts out there and if it's in the wrong location right. it pops up. It's like hang on a minute, then it pops up five times, it's starting to get frustrating yeah. now. And actually I just want to go and book my you know, my table in the restaurant. I've I've done that earlier on today. I bought the, the French yeah. freezer as you said, you know. So it's about appropriate placing. You're right. Well, you're, you're quite happy to read that article within, yeah. dare I say, it, the Echo website. Yeah. But when you get to the bottom and see those sponsored articles, actually, ooh, I don't trust those because that's a load of spam. Yeah, but that's that's sorry, that's a that's a different issue. They're having to do that because no one's buying newspapers, and people are getting their content on social media. They're reading their news on Facebook. They're not buying it <coughs> anymore. So the only way the Echo can survive, I'm not a fan of the Echo, by the way. <laughs> is by pummeling it with adverts. So that creates that bad experience, and people go, the echo's rubbish. But it's because we're not going out and buying, paying up 50p for, and it's the, way the, it's the way consumers are absolutely shifting from historical ways of in, engaging and interacting to this modern way. We take holiday parks, right? Who's from a holiday park? So, so booking.com and Airbnb have completely transformed the hospitality industry forever. It's never going to be the same again. They don't provide anything. They don't do anything. Right? They don't own anything. They don't own any holiday parks. They don't own hotels. They just provide a platform. They provide a mechanism that connects consumers with, with locations. Right? But they've changed. They've changed the industry forever. People trust Booking.com Booking and TripAdvisor more than they trust the, 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 the websites because they look at the websites of holiday parks or hotels and go, yeah, but they're going to say that, aren't they? And that's and that's the challenge. Yeah, but to got. be fair, Booking.com were um, prosecuted recently and told to just correct their ways. Yeah. But, uh, and the trust agree, element yeah. will change. It, it can happen overnight. Look at Facebook. You know, it yeah. changes overnight. Booking.com got caught up with exactly the same yeah. uh, pattern that everyone else does: uh, elevate early prices to make the discounts look better. Yeah. But I think going back to this qualified, mm -hmm. referenced. And peer-reviewed structure. You know, we, we you know, if you're going to put something out that's ten good reasons to eat watercress, that just needs to be qualified. Mm. You know, if you're going to start to say actually, you know, you've got a product here that's got the right amount of vitamin C to get you through the day, it's your RDA. You then qualify it with Lucy, our, our nutritionalist. And then if we're then going to turn around and say, well, there was colorectal cancer research done ten years ago, that's peer-reviewed. And you've got to you've got to think about what you're actually trying to say mm. and make it proportionate to the reference that you're providing. And therefore, you don't don't have a problem. The problem is with Booking.com is everyone thought they're just being genuinely honest all the time, but they've just gone and done what everyone's going to do, and that is try and make more money uh, without thinking about the consequences of a little bit of a trick, yeah. which everybody knows is happening. But you got it, and I will look at every time Booking.com in a different way now because it's it's embedded in here now, and it was only a tiny glitch. But it's about the fact that they weren't really very honest. It was a tiny glitch that made them forty million pounds in two months. Yeah, but you yeah. lose that in about yeah. six months. Yeah, which is which is in it. I think David, in terms of yeah. channels, I think. 
the, di the digital piece starts with actual conversation and people. And we know, it, particularly with the council, we've got about 21 to 23% that are offline in Dorset, across mm -hmm. Dorset. So we know that we've got that demographic that we um, but it, But for us, it is about trying to work with those people and co-design actually other channels perhaps that they, they might use as well. You know, some people still prefer text messaging or, you know, um, Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, leaflets still they to translate into Polish quite a lot. So thinking about kind of the offline uh, audience as well. You're all really annoying because you're answering all my questions. So, <laughs> um, but it's interesting you say that because myself and Nick were talking about that today, about how you potentially technology, old technology that's been around for 10, 15 years, actually is really still very very useful and very very good channel to use sms is yeah. still an incredibly powerful way of connecting to people it's in tv i did some work with an ad agency and they absolutely proved time off time off and again that tv ads have a bigger impact than social media ads uh, i'm saying that in a digital agency office but they absolutely say it has a much big, bigger impact and the creatives in the room will probably adhere to that they'll go yeah has a bigger impact people recognize it and, and, and that's an interesting aside i always go off in a little angle but the reason people say that is because um consumers believe that someone's got a tv ad out there or a big newspaper ad they must be doing well so i trust them more whereas people go oh, it's a facebook ad you know i've just seen that facebook ad for that brand a lot a lot a lot they must be really desperate do you put that radio in that yeah, I think I would, because people hear it. It depends on the radio station. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's that confidence thing. You know, people go, they must be doing well. And people want to be associated with things that are doing well, right? with brands that are doing well. Um, the, 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 the exception you know, in the car industry, well, you all know what the exception is, is Tesla, right? Tesla are, they, that, they don't advertise. They've got, well, they've got a lunatic chief executive who just <laughs> throws money at the stupid thing. And, they're probably going to be taken up by Apple in the next two years, but that, that's the one exception. That even, even Amazon have started advertising on TV now. If you see that, yeah. It also and it it depends how you um, how you define advertising as well. Because yeah. you say they've got a, a lunatic looking after the company. He is their advertising. He's, yeah. he's, 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 he's their PR, he's, isn't he? Twitter outbursts do <laughs> far more than good X work. number of yeah, X number of million that they might spend on Facebook advertising his one tweet that's Do people trust that brand now? I think they are or impressed. Did they, or back to us, did they desire that brand? Yeah, I think they're impressed by his intellect enough to trust what he creates. Yeah. I think they care more about what people think about them driving and then the cars are going to blow up on them or not. <laughs> um, but I think film and TV, that's different because it takes over that that medium why you're watching the advert where online mm -hmm. social it's part of the noise and you, tra and you, get, you train yourself to ignore it mm -hmm. because you just scroll through it so I'm, this is not this is what I'm here for yeah. I'm here for the social network not for the advertising who's trying to make money out of me being in this space so that's really interesting so we go back to the content aspect so how do you stop people doing that on social media how do you stop people just going scroll 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 how do you stop them how do you, how, how do you get their attention? You know, how do you go? Oh well. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So what? Imagery. Imagery. Yeah. So what kind of what kind of what kind of stuff do you do? You do? Let's pick on Dave again here because you're the one that's got a lot of solutions for customers. So how do you stop? You know, I'm I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the web. Will stop. Over the next five to ten years, the web will slow down. The web will become a. We've talked about this, Jay. The web will become a much more creative space than just these templates and the same look and feel and everyone knows where buttons are and that. People will, it will become much more of an entertainment platform again, right? It will be a thing of beauty. But how do you advise clients? Because I don't get involved in all the client day to day stuff. So how do you... I think, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's trying to be different. It's trying to stand out. It's using, you, you know, I think you want to go look at the likes of Facebook, and dare I say, even LinkedIn has started to become like Facebook recently. Mm. Yeah, the kind of content that's being put up on there, lots of video content, lots of imagery, um, you know, lots of, you know, not quite the cat videos yet, but you know, some, some of that kind of content is spreading into what I class as a, as, as a professional network. Um, so, 
I think it is about standing out. Um, there's some people in the room here that do very, very well. I'm looking at you guys. Pick on them. Pick on them. Yeah, yeah. You know. Why? Why, 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 why? why did um, these guys do it so well without embarrassing them too much? I, I, think, you're, I think you're funny. You know, in, in, you, know you, you, have a, um, you have a serious side because you, you have products to sell, wedding dresses. Really, yeah, I was going to say, don't just point. Pre-loved <laughs> <laughs> pre wedding dresses. So you guys are selling um, pre-loved wedding dresses. And I think, you know, your social channels are, 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 are brilliant. And we were talking about that earlier, about you taking over somebody else's mm. channel for the, for the day. So give us an example then, if you don't mind, just share, sharing it with um, you. Well, we took over someone, we did a page takeover recently. Um, of a blogger in the UK who's one of the best wedding bloggers. And we took over their page recently and we noticed that we were um, quite, our post that they posted about us was rating higher than anyone else's posts on her page. Uh, so it's just really interesting for us, you know, to be able to, to see that what we're doing is, is right. Even we have 20 less thousand likes than they do. And we were still forty thousand. Our pages are still forty thousand reaches ahead of theirs. And to, you know, and it's to do with our content. Yeah. And we know that what they're what they're constantly posting about is, um, whilst it is lots of different things, it fits into two genres of um, advertising wedding fairs and styled shoots and inspo for weddings. So, but whilst there's lots of different things they talk about in those two genres, that's generally their content. Whereas we make sure we do three things a day at set time, um, and it has been working for us. We do have to change every now and again when we notice a big, a, a, like an algorithm change or yep. a drop, and we do change. We used to do our main post of the day, which is our product. We used to do that in an evening, and now we do it in the morning, um, mainly because sadly for us, what we sell isn't. Um, we sell wedding dresses. So when somebody likes a wedding dress on Facebook, obviously lots of people in your newsfeed will see that you've liked that wedding dress. And the wedding industry, so generally Facebook doesn't like the wedding industry because it's a lot of things you want to keep private till the day. So if you like a picture of a wedding dress, Auntie Sarah will say, oh, I didn't think you liked that dress. I thought you'd have gone for something more traditional. Um, and, and you know, because she's like, oh no, someone's seen it because obviously I've commented on it and now everyone can see it. So, for us, our, our reach works quite poorly for Facebook because people aren't interacting with our main product because they don't want people to see it. But it's what we sell and yeah. it has to be seen. So our other two posts throughout the day um, are a social post where we engage with people socially um, that are local or experts in our industry. And then in an evening, we chuck out the memes and, yeah. and it gets all the engagement. <laughs> and all the engagement comes in. So on our, on our morning post, we're only getting a reach of about 1,000. On our midday post, we're only getting a reach of about 1,000. But on an evening, we're getting about 10,000 and lots of people engaging. But then by the next morning, that's kind of helped the next yeah. day's posts. So it's <coughs> thinking about our industry like that. But I was at a similar kind of thing um, recently with a, another lady and I was moaning about how Facebook hates the wedding industry and we have to try really hard because what, what we sell is not, you know, it doesn't like to share it. And she went, I sell knives for crabbing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she said, every time we post something about crabbing, um, they, the Facebook just take the knives away. I was like, okay, you win. <laughs> so it was, for us, it's thinking about what else will make our posts better. So that, that third post, is that always related to yours or, or could be completely the just something the second independent post of, and human? It's the second post of the day needs to, for us needs to still kind of be relatable to our, our industry. Yeah or local. So today I've posted about the school coming to see us and they gave us an eco-friendly plaque, same as Tom, um, because we're a sustainable company so it links in a little bit with that and it's to do with something local. But then the meme in the evening generally is to do with relationships. <laughs> okay. Facebook, Facebook is inherently local. You know, it's a great yeah. little sort of um, plug for a local area and you can then build off that outside of that area. Yeah. But it does really work well with communities. And if you've got something that is a bit of a, not necessarily a call to action, but it's actually relevant, it's something that people feel that they're going to do some good with it, mm. then it helps a lot. So if we talk about you know, milk bottles and refilling milk bottles, crazy numbers, because people feel that it's genuine, you, you're trying to improve something. Uh, if you find a set of keys, one of the best ever yeah. posts, someone left a set of mini keys in the shop, you know, 16,000 reach on that one. Or if you're looking to try and support 
you know, a customer that you know would like something for nothing. You know, it's an obvious one, mm. but we do it. But it's more of a gift than it is a competition because we then say, well, this is your opportunity to go and give that to a really good friend of yours. Mm. You know, it's 120 quid's worth of uh, vouchers. So it's all about trying to make sure that you know that there is something genuinely good about it that helps us. Uh, I, we're quite serious. We're not that <coughs> funny at all, really. Um, I try to keep the humour out because the butcher's idea of humour is off the scale. <laughs> so, uh, you know, sort of bringing sausages out inappropriately isn't going to work for us. We're, we're quite, you know, sort of normal, quite serious on that point. But we're, we're sort of trying to be sort of a little bit of a force of good. That's our mantle. Mm. And it works really well for us. Um, so that, that does work, you know, and then obviously everything else sits around it as a support. How many times have you used that sausage joke? <laughs> Never before. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know you mentioned it either. I'll make a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I just need to start things up and sit back. This is great. It's fine. Well, I, was just, doing I, I was just thinking of the Facebook stuff in terms of going back to this trust issue. Yeah. Is we're seeing a number, not only of our clients, but within the industry, moving into closed Facebook groups. And I wonder, I wonder whether that is, you know, about a trust issue. You know, actually, we're going to let people in, invited. Yeah, we're then going to have this trusted group of individuals that we encourage conversations. But is that a veneer of trust, or is that? Well, a... it's back to that, you know, what's going on inside yeah. there. Is it really? Yeah, but Everyone something to think about. Maybe a close group for the wedding. We have a close group. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have one for our suppliers, for our customers, and our team mm -hmm. team members. Um, the closed group for the customers is, is doing quite well. It's, yeah. gr it's growing uh, a thousand people a year really and I'm not really pushing it that much but as soon as I push it and post that group into other groups to say yeah. join our group, you do get a bit of an influx um, that way. Yeah. I've seen, I'm sorry, I've seen it with a, car a caravaners group, 75,000 plus closed group, invite only, and um, the stuff they put on there is, you know, where can I take the dog? You know, where's the dog friendly holding park? Or you know, we're taking the van out this weekend. What's the appropriate you know, mm. stuff to take with us? It, 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 some of it is quite banal, but at the same time, I'm thinking here's seventy thousand people that are in there having conversations. Mm. That's why we find the groups important, especially yeah. if we're when we're advertising on our page, our pages. Um, <coughs> we often will share that post to a group because we know that there's people in that group asking for yep. what we sell. Um, it's just a bit, bit of extra admin, really. <coughs> mm. But they're hanging out in the group, so... Yeah. And they're loyal. Yeah. Which is a big part of it, isn't it? But what about people going into these closed groups? People, uh, like, like I've got friends just come off social media all together, just, they're just on, like, closed WhatsApp groups and stuff. It's because they want to get away from businesses. Um, but they don't want to be advertised to. So how... How, how do you deal with that? That is my next question. <laughs> how are you going to use tech in the future when people are using more closed groups? <laughs> Go on then, answer that. But it is a realistic challenge. My, I've got a 15 year old daughter. Um, she's beginning to come off social media. She's not on Facebook. It's for the old people. She's not on. It is, right? She, Twitter, no interest. What is Twitter about? It's Snap and it's WhatsApp. They're the next consumers. She used British Airways. I said, can you check that I was driving? Can you find the flight from British Airways? She was like, what is this website? What? what? Doesn't make any sense. It's not clear enough. This is a 15 year old intelligent girl, I would say that, intelligent girl who, and very tech savvy. What? And BA have spent millions on their website getting it absolutely perfect. Fifteen, five years time, she's going to be, you know, put a pretty you know, a significant consumer. She's like, this makes no sense. I'm not used to this tech. I'm not used to looking, you know, responsive first. I'm not used to it. I'm used to transacting and interacting. On, you're right, boss. Snap, what's that? We're just asking the person. I'm just asking the person next to you. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a real challenge. How? Yeah. Immediacy. Yeah, well, immediacy is an important part. Yeah. They have very limited scope, though, don't they? I mean, you can't at check the moment, it on times. Or... At the moment, they do. At the moment, what would be stopping? Let's take Instagram, right? Instagram had a limited scope when it came out. It was just images. Now you can transact, you can communicate, you can buy, you can buy, you know, buy stuff back the same as transaction, but you can really communicate with each other on Instagram, which, when it started, was basically Flickr on steroids, right? Where's Flickr now? But they're they're all. 
you know, progressing towards being like a web page, basically, mm. aren't they? You know, they start yeah. off as a little app, and then mm. gradually they're becoming a, a web page, and you think, well, I may as well just go to a web page. But it's the, the way they're interacting. But that, oh, my point was, the younger generation aren't. They're not going to a web page. You know, she's going, I'm not. I don't want to interact with that. Well, I've got find an eight-year-old, and she's way. going to web page. <laughs> find me another. She's fine, but this is a 15-year-old <coughs> teenager who's got some disposable income. He's going, I'm, I'm not using that. I'm going to. I'm going to in interact with this brand using my Instagram account, and that's the challenge. What? So she's purchasing through yeah. Instagram yeah. on stuff that she's been selling yeah. by her friends. By her friends. Yeah. Not and by there's brands. a direct link. Not by brands. Yeah. And they're able to like package the thing up and send it through to your door. Yeah. Well, it's not Instagram doing it; it's the organisation doing it. Well, that's where the, the rise of voice is going to come into play a lot more. And have, have voice activated yeah. commands. Um, yeah, it's but it is though, isn't it? Yeah. Say that again. It's almost like you could invent a box where you could type in a number, speak to the company, and ask them what you want to do. It's amazing, isn't it? That's where it's the shops are coming back for yeah. that reason. Yeah. Because the, uh, particularly youngsters, they like immediacy. You know, the, the teenage brain works on immediacy. Mm. That's why they get so angry if you can't answer them clearly. And the idea of going to a shop and actually buying something and walking away with it actually is the ultimate immediacy of consumer well, consumption. Argos, yeah. that, that, that's okay. the wrong word, Argos. They have, I know they've been taken over by Sainsbury's, but they have transformed their business model because it's that immediacy. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. I, can, I have to wait a day for Amazon. I'll spend an extra five and I'll pick it up this yeah. afternoon from Argos. Yeah, your idea about getting frustrated that you know, I can't read the website and all yeah. that kind of thing, that's what happens when you buy a pair of shoes that don't fit. Mm. You know, they just throw, you know, my son, he just doesn't understand what my wife's doing, buying shoes so much on bikes. They, they never get a pair that work, or you have to buy three <coughs> pairs, and they don't have that ability to do that. And I think things are going to change a lot, because I think we've just gone through a bit of a learning curve. Well, right? There was a novelty of the internet where, oh, I can go on to someone's website, mm. and then people, I think companies became arrogant by saying, well, we can show them all this stuff we want to show yeah. them when they, when they only want to come and do, like, find out our phone number, but we can make them look at all this other stuff. Mm. Consumers are at a point now, well, I want, just want to ask them this question. I don't want to see all this other crap you want to show me. Mm. Just give me that answer back. And I think that's, it's trying to rebalance that, um, that relationship where uh, organisations don't feel like they um, have the right to make you look at all, all the stuff they want you to see. It's equivalent to, the, to, to going into a shop and, and, and saying you want, pack, you want a packet of crisps though, and you it? just, you just it's say... It's coming back to trust, isn't it? Yeah, you don't want your packet of crisps, you want you, all You talk about Instagram and things, mm. and that's all via friends, so it's all related to recommendations and trust rather than just searching for a <coughs> website and X amount. You're getting that trust from people that you trust and therefore you develop that trust don't you? It's, yeah. I think it's not just people that you trust either because I rely a lot on reviews as well if I want to buy a product I look at how many you know, likes it's got, positive comments and like you say TripAdvisor is, is trusted more than the actual websites of the, the accommodation themselves. So. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's just to do with trust, I think it's Yeah, because I've gone time. away from TripAdvisor and trust because you always get people so I'm not completely convinced by, yeah. Yeah. Back to Tom's point about booking. Yeah. 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 But aren't we, aren't we pretending a little bit that we're going to check out a consumer society? I mean, taking your point, which is like a little bit doom and gloom, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> um, you know, we're not checking out a consumer society. I still like to look at whatever it might be, uh, you know, a £200,000 boat from Sunseeker or, uh, you know, a, a, a £10 radio alarm clock and I like to see that it's got certain features and it does certain things or, you know, my shoes that I'm buying, whatever it might be and I need to see all those things, they need to be communicated somehow, it has to be done and that's only going to be done through advertising, so I don't think we've seen the last of it, really. It just I, needs to be done in a different way. Yeah, for my I generally don't think it's to do with time as well. So they used to sell the online thing as being, um, you don't have to leave your house. So people <laughs> used to go, oh, we don't have to leave my house. But you go onto Amazon and you go, oh, I don't have to leave my house today if I order this. But actually, I want it now, so I'm going to leave my house today. Yeah. I'm going to get this from somewhere else. It I think work. it's generally to do with, it's obviously trust, but... I think it's, it's, it's people's time is a lot more, con they're conscious more of time these days. Yeah. It's a commodity, isn't it? Mm. They think time has turned into a commodity. Mm. Hence. Can, I, can I just quickly mention one other? So, uh, another business that was in the Tech Nation thing that we were at on Tuesday, um, they're called Sara Lee, they're, they're also one of the 10 
advertising star companies, and they produce technology that verifies images. So they're what they're doing a lot of work with Facebook, and so, so basically they can they use artificial intelligence to be able to spot if an image has been doctored. So you can then, in time, you'll be able to get and like a like almost like a watermark on approval that it's a genuine image. So it stops companies on Instagram, for example, making something look better or you know. But then what's the threshold for doctoring? Is it adding a filter? Is it you know touching up something? Is it completely changing the, so the, the parameters? The, the, the example they gave was a was a was a protest outside of the mirror headquarters, um, sorry the mail headquarters, and they doctored it with a to put a knife in front of the you know one of the protesters, and the and the the, the system had picked up that that knife had been artificially added in. So it's it's I, I don't I don't I don't know how the algorithm works, but it's it's just another. It's just another example or a means of verifying that these digital images are accurate, which is another another factor in trust that you can just because something's shared with you on Instagram it doesn't necessarily, you know, you could put your water, watercress factory in a location that wasn't mm -hmm. true, or you could have an interview with someone that wasn't done. So it's a, just a way of being able to sort of make it. So any tech that creates mistrust is kind of turning it around on itself, isn't it? It's what we're doing, right? We're turning it around on itself. There's quite, a, there's quite a few examples of um, pieces of technology that are becoming those sort of barriers to try and filter things. Like um, we were talking about um, um, not clicking, not clicking a Facebook link directly in Facebook yeah. because you 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 don't want to sort of feed into that system, but instead going, oh, I'm interested in that project, product. Let me you wouldn't believe it, it until you saw it. But yeah. Yeah. Um, Firefox um, browser, for example, they have their own extension that they build that walls Facebook in to make sure that you can interact with Facebook in there, but it makes sure that everything that you're doing doesn't get out of this extension. It doesn't sort of follow you around your day while you're browsing here or browsing there. And I think there's quite a lot of these, like we were saying about the, uh, the image, um, software. I think there's quite a lot of these little, yeah, a lot of these little um, sort of tech things to help you help you trust what you're looking at because you know that you've got this um, this barrier, and it might be um, it might be removing all the adverts that are there and replacing them with ones that are um, certified that they're not sharing your data around, that they're not tracking you and stuff like that. Um, and I think there's quite a, I think. There's going to be more and more of that, where it's going to be more difficult for these sort of rogue, untrustworthy systems to get through because everyone's browser is going to update over time and automatically have these systems that are filtering those out. So it's almost going to become enforced trust in okay. order to be in order to get in front of that, someone. That's ultimately what the platform itself should be doing to to promote authenticity. However, they also want to take as many. Revenue stream, so there's that continual contradiction, isn't there? And they're, 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 I think, I think sorry, James, they're, they're data, they're surveillance companies. Facebook, mm -hmm. Instagram, Snappy Snap, they make their money out of us. That's, free. That's, that's their Google. Well, it's, it's not free, right? <laughs> they, they, they use our data. But you said you showed a great video about say, how the internet was broken because yes. it's free. Yeah. Because these people have got, they're not going to give you this amazing um, platform on Facebook for nothing. So if, if, you, if we start doing things to try and circumvent that, that means these, these people, they're not going to get paid. Mm. So they're going to become, they're going to find other ways to make their money from that money. So it's, it's, I think it's, it's almost like a broke system. Whatever, whatever's going to be on there, if you're not prepared to pay for it. Right. It's the same as newspapers. Yeah. yeah, newspapers went through this a long time ago. Mm. So spurious claims and then eventually newspapers then gave themselves a brand that gave them Notoriety that they were had pro qualified professional journalists that would give you that confidence that you were reading something, and obviously that's gone mm. and drifted off as well. But there's no reason why that whole system doesn't go full circle. And Absolutely. And, and you the see, contract of the internet using the internet is something that's been raised this week. And you've seen it now. Yeah, it's a, the Guardian has, is more profitable now than it has been for the last 25 years because people are subscribing to it and are donating to it. They want to know, it's, it's like local magazine. I know you, you say the Echo. No, sure, yeah. yeah. but the Echo really, as a responsibility in this area, should be journalists that are going into uh, county council offices and holding um, the council businesses, individuals to account. And that was the whole point about the local magazine network, is to provide uh, control to prevent corruption. And once corruption starts to increase in local areas, because the, it's not being reported and raised the community, 
it will come back again. So it's just a matter of time. It's just, it's not supposed to be about advertising businesses that are paper. It's supposed to be about being a trustworthy source that you go and buy it to actually ensure that you are aware of what's going on in your local area. That's fundamentally what it is. It's just forgotten what it's supposed to be doing. To an extent, we could go off in this angle, but 95% of their revenue has been taken by Facebook and Google because of the advertising revenue they were getting enabled people to go into the council offices and they've kind of lost that. And back on, back on your point, I believe the system is broken. I mean, most people here, well, who's got an Apple? Who uses Safari? They've got an ad blocker. Oh no, you can install an ad blocker. Yeah, well, which partly turned on automatically. Partly turned on automatically. So they are making a conscious effort under their under under Tim Cook's process of saying we are going to not put adverts in front of you. And as a nice aside, we're going to stop Google and Facebook getting money. <laughs> right? That, that is pretty much what it is. So I think I'd say, I think Tom, you're right, absolutely right, Tom. And your point, Nick, is completely valid. We're going to see, and coming from Ross's argument. We're going to see technology being used against each other in the interest of stopping people seeing things that tech companies don't think they want to see. Do, do you know what I mean? And that's a real challenge for businesses because whereby previously you might have got in front of certain people for a social channel, for an advert, now it's going to be a lot harder through no one's fault apart from the tech platforms who have lost trust in, in, in individuals. I'm conscious of time. This has flowed quite well, hasn't it? <laughs> which is the whole point, I think. Um, so I want to take, take, take what we've talked about and just to step forward a little bit. So how are each of you three in the, the areas you work in and, and everyone as a whole, how are, you, how, how are you thinking of using tech in the future to address some of these challenges, Lisa? So, so, from a, so we, we saw that quick PR, PR video around the guys with learning and physical disabilities and using using kind of um, a bit of VR, um, so how are you, what initiatives, what are you looking at doing? This is interesting, so I was, I was kind of listening, I think we're like, we're really winning, aren't we? We just throw our details out through this social media and then you end up getting all these adverts, but actually, and although I think from a public sector perspective, I would like to think we've always got good intentions, but then people are really reluctant to actually share their data with us or kind of like, you know, really yeah, so. we'll give it to Facebook. Yeah, give it to they Facebook. Give it to the council, don't trust it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't trust us. Um, I mean, we've got, another, we've got another project. It's one of them is Dorset Care Record, which is a, it's a big um, data sharing project across numerous um, health partners and, and social care partners in the in county, well, it's going forward in the county now, isn't it? It's a bit wider. Um, yeah, so sort of using the kind of data side, tech side, virtuality, we are great to see some of the stuff that James was doing here around the voice stuff, we'll be interested in looking at how we can use that. Don't, don't beat like him up anymore. James, if you <laughs> don't beat him up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think what else is on my mind's gone down. Well, I think part of the challenge for us is, as you say, there's, there's a, there is a kind of natural reluctance for people to share data that we collectively can use to help them. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I think to, I mean, there's some real tensions there actually because some of the work we do, I think most people would think already that within the NHS your information is shared. So your hospital is sharing it with the next hospital, is sharing it with the GP. They're not. Yeah. Well, that's by facts. <laughs> but that's because that, that is the most, that is such a good point. Yeah. People are so willing to give their information to Facebook but unwilling to give it to the council. Yeah. It, and the NHS, it is the most... In 34 years' time, people will look back and go, what? That's nuts. You gave your data. And, the, and you know, you don't even have to have a Facebook account from Facebook to know who you are. That was an eye-opener for me. Uh, uh, you think I'd know. I didn't know that this Facebook pixel knew who I was, even though I've never been on Facebook. I've been on Facebook for 10 years. And, and that made me really cross. <laughs> My trust is completely gone in that, but it is the most bizarre, so it's a social experiment, isn't it? I, I, I'm convinced Zuckerberg's doing a big social experiment. Um, so you've got to get over that challenge of, of convincing people that actually you want their data for good, not to sell them knives. <laughs> That's that poor person. <laughs> so what about you, Tom? How, from a, from a, 
from a tech perspective and you know projecting forward 12 months 18 months i know it's difficult to know but it is very very difficult to know because what we're doing 12 months ago is so different isn't it Jeff? Yeah. so yeah. you know we're quite happy to uh, adapt so everything we're doing is constantly adapting uh, we're very critical about what we've achieved and what we could achieve um, and in the short term we're making some steps in some very basic you know sort of advertising platforms you know it's nothing nothing wrong with that that needs, still needs to be done mm. we're testing out other ways of communicating to our potential customers but tech um, will be driven by the professionals that we employ to help us get through that I'm not going to be able to predict what we're going to be using but we are, we are going to end up trying to create more trusted content so you know we'll be obviously building a, a studio our own sort of video studio effectively so we can do our own broadcasting from our farms. That's a simple way of doing it. We can invite individuals in that we choose to help broadcast with us. So that's a very simple way of using tech because again it's just going back to content, ensuring that your content is correct. And that's what we spend most of our time debating is how can we ensure that that is going to be the case. The platforms that we put it on and the tech we use is being developed elsewhere. Sure. Happy with that. They'll come to us, they'll be advising us on where to go, but we just need to focus as a business on making sure your message is clear and then take the advice from others that have tested and tried it. And also outside of your industry. We're the same. <coughs> we're the same, exactly. We often we're, say we're, the same. Same. we're both dyslexic. Well, yeah, we're both yeah. dyslexic. <laughs> but we're the same. <laughs> we need help. For, for us, it's generally yeah. because similar to what you're saying about your daughter being 15 so mm -hmm. most people get married these days average our target audience is 27 to, four, to four, about 47 so we're all still using Facebook because we think it's great mm -hmm. um, in what five years some of the, girl, the girls that are going to start chipping in to get married I've got friends with kids that are 20, in their early 20s not on Facebook mm -hmm. yeah. and that is my biggest and Facebook's been my biggest sort of platform for six years um, and in less than that time, it won't be. Yeah. So Great point. because my audience will be moving Moved into, yeah. they'll be getting married, and the people that have already got married will be gone. Maybe, maybe they'll come back in second and third marriages. Maybe that's my audience. <laughs> <laughs> that's maybe my target audience will be, you know, again. If, if we'll see. <laughs> yeah. It's not a problem, is it? It's no. just, it's just mm -hmm. one of those things. As long as you understand it's going to happen, yeah. you yeah. just adapt to it. But then most sort of businesses have to continually adapt. Mm -hmm. That's the should, only way you go. Should there be a conscious decision for the, the, the same story, but should should it be adapted for different platforms? Should you be thinking about what sort of user is using each platform and modifying your your, your content accordingly? Yeah. Absolutely. This is for you. Yeah, because I'm, I'm going, that leads into my question to you, which is, a, you know, like James said, should it be adapted for different platforms? And b, projecting forward five years or two years, I know it's difficult. What kind of platforms do you think, Dave, with your, you know, and the team, and put them on a the spot? It's not just you up here. Um, where do we think that's going to go? I. That is putting you on the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that, I think there's a yeah, there, there is so much happening. You know, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, voice is, is going to be massive. Um, my daughter is currently she's 15. She's on TikTok. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is yeah, what's TikTok? 20, 20 <laughs> second video clips. TikTok. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah hands up. TikTok. <laughs> what? What? Yeah, I'm just like, whoa, hang on a minute. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. Um, this is like a vine. You know. Um, more effectively. So what is it? Just, just. No. It, it is. It's like. What um, is it? It's, 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 a, it's a twenty second video platform. Right. And but people do it to to use it. You'll have, um, yeah, people. I don't know, taking a, an office chair and running down the office um, to music. And it's it's just. Bizarre. That's called Benny Hill. Yeah. Is, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I keep saying we need to get Ella in to do we do. presentations to us <laughs> and tell us about these new things. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that part, part of it is, you, you, you talk about adaptability, I think adaptability is absolutely key, but you've got to understand it first. Yeah. You know, it's about being aware of what are the platforms out there. You know, we, we talk about Snapchat, Instagram, WhatsApp, etc. But, you know, what about all the other platforms around. What about the close groups? We've always spoke differently um, to different audiences on different platforms, which is why we've never used anything like Hootsuite, because yeah. we've, we actually like to target our, our voice to it's the people saying yes queen on um, Facebook that absolutely would never say that <laughs> on a different platform. So, yeah. you know, we, we speak in the way that, and I think that will probably continue.
yeah. and because there's always going to be these platforms and I think what has to happen is that businesses have to be adaptable and flexible and have to have that mindset because there's never a one fix all solution. And it is back to Joe's quite different voices, yeah. different content, maybe different, you know, creating a, a you know, McCarthy and Stone who were here at the last event, I mean, yeah, they're a FTSE company but they have the same challenges. They, they, they create a, a package of content on a particular subject and it could be a blog, it could be an article, it could be a video, it could be some imagery, it could be a, a, a cheeky um, meme and they use the same bulk of content across, they cut it and shunt it different ways depending on the platform that it works and I think you know, that, that kind of an adaptability is okay what we're talking about, yeah. what's our voice as an organisation, so Tom's point around this is who we are to this market, we're going to stick to that and we're going to produce different types of content that, that have the same message but we're going to jigsaw it, jigsaw those pieces together in a slightly yeah. different way. But also bear in mind that we need to be resourceful with it because yeah. actually there's a cost yeah, there's a cost. Right? You know, social media, they keep saying it's free, it's not free. Right. You know, oh, no, it's the time, time, the effort. Yeah, you know, 100%. That, we, we know. Our, our franchisees, if they work full time, they're working 140 hours yep. um, a month, 30 hours is, are with customers, 10 hours cleaning up after customers, 100 hours, that's so they then market their business. So it's, it's absolutely not free because their 100 hours of their job is marketing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, you asked about technology, of yeah. course, all this can happen. If we have a connectivity and the infrastructure yeah. in the same place, and we're starting to talk, we mentioned kind of smart normal place really, and how we can kind of connect up more and also, and then thinking about connected homes as well for people, and that comes back to the social care and assisted living like, um, agenda, and, and how we can use devices in people's homes to help keep them independent rather than expensive care. That's, that's really interesting. The internet, we want to talk about the internet things tonight, but that leads to talking about Jamie's piece and our voice, that really clever stuff Jamie's yeah. done off the, off the back of just a conversation we had, which we will show you when we get, maybe not tonight, but we'll, we'll, if you're interested, Jamie has um, developed a very, very smart voice, integrated voice and website platform. You talk into Alexa and it puts something on your website pretty much and vice versa. So that really simplifies it. I know it's not quite like that. But um Ultra Fast is coming. Ultra yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've still uh, our, super, our super fast uptake in Dorset is around fifty five percent but we've ninety eight coverage. Yeah. So there's still work to do uh, getting people to to use it. So collaboration, I mean, that's yeah. like tonight bringing businesses together. Yeah. There's a lot to be said for like-minded like businesses using each other's social to, to you know, and not being to tell each other's stories or mm. yeah. you know, share a meme. I mean, that's, that's the purpose. Mm. You, know, you know, if we're being honest, I think we, wanted, we want to have events like this. We don't really want it to call it an event. We just want, we're really passionate, aren't we, Dave, about, I know, I know Lisa is, I know all you guys are, about creating a real digital knowledge and a, a community around here that's confident and comfortable in talking to each other about how we can use technology in a different way. I mean, people that live, you know, there's, there are people in, who live in this area that are, a friend of mine lives in Dorchester, he, he works on Star Wars. He's one of the directors on Star Wars using the very latest tech. We're going to get him, he's going to talk at the next event, hopefully. We have such talent around us. And we just want to bring people into this area, into this environment, and just chat and talk. Um, we're not selling anything, believe it or not. Just come and use it like basis. Come use the facilities, chat. Um, uh, and there's talent here, and there's a bit here, and like Lisa said, the network's getting quicker. People are going to be pushing on. We've got some brains. We've got some great brains in the area, like Tom and Dave and Ross and that. So, and you guys, you're all smart people. So there's some real talent here. You don't need to go to Bournemouth or Bristol to find it. Right? Um, it's eight o'clock. We've taken. That's gone on a bit longer than we yeah. we, we planned, and, uh, and everyone's um, got things to do. I'm sure. Um, thank you, you three. Um, the two of you, we've got a present. Are in this box? Yeah, it is. Oh, you could have wrapped some up, mate. Eh? Oh, there's three. That's one for me as well. So I'm sorry we haven't wrapped it up. But there you go. So that's a local gift box. And there's, there's a spare bottle for me. Or anyone that wants to as well. So, um, has anyone got any questions? I mean, everyone's been chatting, which has been great. So has anyone got anything to ask any of the three up there? No? Brilliant. Yes, best thing. Um, there's food left, there's a few drinks left.
the next event we are hoping to do in the summer. Thank you. We're also hoping to do it, although we haven't twisted our arm yet, with Palmer's Brewery, who are one of our clients. We're launching a new website for them in April, which you'll all see. Um, fantastic design. Hey, Jamie. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we're hoping to do something with them, and we're hoping to type some charity stuff as well. And, 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 but we're going to talk about creativity. So there's one or two people in this room who have been talking tonight who are going to be on the panel. Um, and we're hoping to get Dan, who's one of the guys who works on Star Wars and uh, Star Trek and big Hollywood films, try and get him on the panel as well to chat. How we're going to get Star Wars into how we can make people go to your websites, we don't know, yeah, but there'll be some learning we can take from there. Okay, so help yourself, thank you very much for your time. Help yourself to another drink and some food, but um, thank you, you three as well.